Hello and welcome to Weekly MTG from Home. I'm Blake. That's Steve holding up his mug there. We have a great show for you today. We are taking a kind of a mulligan. Not really, though. <laughs> just, a mulligan? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, let's, It's that's really just yeah. part two of uh, our chat with Django Wexler, the author of Sundered Bond, the Ecoria Lair Behemoths uh, ebook. Last time we had Django on the show, a uh, great show, fun show, wonderful having him on, but we didn't let him really talk about the book. Yeah, uh, it wasn't really out yet, so we didn't want to spoil anything, but right. now it's out. It's, it's out. Game. It's been out for a little bit. If Open you season. head to basically anywhere that you get ebooks, you can head to Amazon, uh, download Sundered Bond by Django Wexler. It's out, read it. Uh, so if you haven't read it yet and you don't want to hear spoilers, you just just look away now. Yeah, that's uh, cool. We're, we're we won't, unleashing. You can watch it later. Yeah, you can watch it later. Yeah, we're unleashing fine. Django. He's going to be able to talk about anything and everything from the books. He's going to answer your questions that we've taken on Twitter and that you can drop in the chat. And yeah, no holds barred. Any, anything's game. But uh, first. Steve's going to do the news. I am. I'm going to do the news. And we have uh, we have some Magic the Gathering Arena news to deliver today, specifically about FNM at home. And we've got a graphic that looks really cool that we uh, look at that little ice cream cone. So happy there in the, in the swirly sun. That's right. FNM at home. Uh, we were able to say that support for this is going to continue through May, uh, which is very exciting all the way through the month of May. And uh, this week, if we go to the next graphic, is going to be Standard Singleton. On April 24, it'll be uh, no entry fee, and you'll get uh, ICR rewards up to two wins, which is pretty great. Uh, the other cool thing that we're doing is you might see in that graphic a little pack that has MTG Arena on. It's a little yellow pack. Uh, if you connect with a local WPN store you can get a code for an MTG Arena promo pack for participating in FNM at home. Codes are gonna be new every week. Players are gonna have two weeks to redeem them. And we have a code for you right now that you can redeem. Uh, it's gonna be on the next graphic. I know it's crazy. It's, uh, you can enter in the code play at home to get a pack with two cosmetic uh, items for MTG Arena. There's a special promo pack, two cosmetic items. Uh, those items could include card styles, card sleeves and more. Uh, more, for example, includes what's on this next slide, which I think is really great. Uh, this Tamiyo avatar, which is only available in the MTG Arena promo pack. So a lot to do here. Uh, once again, that code is play at home, and that's also going to be on the uh, MTG Arena uh, FNM at home page. Uh, so you can enter in that code. But if you missed it, you, you're watching this later, don't worry, you can still redeem it. It's the same for all. Uh, don't forget that codes that you get from your WPN store are new every week and you only have two weeks to redeem them. Please uh, contact your WPN store, see if they're participating. And if they are, you have a chance to play some magic, play some FNM at home, and also get these cool promo packs for some cool cosmetic items in Magic the Gathering Arena. But as cool as that is, it's not as cool as our guest today, which is Django Wexler back finally after the long year that we, not year, sorry, two weeks, two weeks since he was last on uh, for him to, for him to be able to come on and talk Sundered Bond. Django, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? Doing it great. does feel like it's been a year, doesn't it? It it's, does. It really does. Yeah. You know, it just is. hanging out, staving off the darkness. Whatever, yeah, you know. Whatever works. Uh, it, in all seriousness, uh, last time we talked, you said you were doing pretty good. Still, things still good despite the yeah. state of the just world. Go gotten a new routine and i mean i live in in um in washington and redmond so so many of my friends are amazon or google or microsoft so mm -hmm. working at home is like pretty normal and so yeah in some ways it feels like we're having like a giant house party but like um, <laughs> like nobody's it, invited i don't i don't want to be insensitive because it's obviously mm -hmm. you know we're lucky to that we uh we have that mm -hmm. that ease um yeah but uh no it's not so bad getting a lot of uber eats and Yep, we're doing the same. I took my first uh, staycation since this nice. whole thing started. It was amazing, and I didn't realize how much I needed it. Um, Is that where you stay home but just don't work? We actually have a family cabin that we went to. It's only oh, about wow. an hour away. So, That's great. Um, 
Yeah, it, it's, you know, we have um, a nearly 18 month old child and both oh. my wife and wife and I are working. So there's just like no time off. So even a day like yesterday, we were home, but I took or Tuesday, we were home, but I took the day off. And even just not having to worry about work while Jace ran around yeah. uh, was was kind of amazing. So I recommend it to anyone working at home. The lines yeah. between work and Big mood, not yeah. work, <laughs> they tend to blur. It, in a way, I feel like like I have an advantage here because that's like my life. It's always been, it's been my life for like eight years now, <laughs> and so I'm like, oh yeah, work. Blurred lines between work and and uh, home. That's mm -hmm. like normal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, no. it's all been preparation. For most people, it's not. Um, but we are gonna, you know what? This this is a little bit of, of blending uh, work and play because we are gonna talk about your work, Sundered Bond. Um, but it's a really fun story. Um, confession time. I'm only, according to my e-reader, fifty six percent of the way through the book. So I'm not done with it yet. So we're only going to ask 56% of we're your questions. We're only going to ask 50 oh, that's, no. <laughs> that's not true. We already know, we, because we work at Wizards, we already know um, the plot and everything in the broad outlines. But I've just had fun um, reading it and just enjoying the journey. And there's a lot about it that you don't get from uh, just the cards or just knowing the plot. And so we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, so let's let's start, Django. Why don't you again? Spoiler alerts abound. Um, why don't you just describe kind of the story as a whole and, and the parts you hope resonate with Magic fans? Um, God, put me on the spot. Why don't yeah, you? Yeah, we're starting like, with it, a big it's question. It's been a while since I wrote yeah. this story. Like <laughs> I think I actually finished it before the end of the year, and because we were doing edits. But mm -hmm. um, okay, so you have, and the other thing is the. I'm going to pronounce these names the way they pronounce in my head, but I have no idea if that's actually correct. Okay. Uh, like I say, Luca, it might be Lucca. I don't really no, know. No, it's, it's, it's Luca. Luca. Luca? Okay. Luca. You're good. Yep. I have only seen anything written down. Um, yep. So um, Luca works for the city of Dranith and uh, with his, his fiance, Jirina, and he's uh, one of their elite monster hunters. Um, but then he encounters a winged cat and ha feels a sort of new supernatural bond with it, um, which in Dranith is, is very much a no-no. They hate uh, monsters and anyone who bonds with monsters. Uh, and so Luca is arrested because of that. But his fiance breaks him out on the theory that she can eventually talk um, her father, who mm -hmm. is sort of head, uh, General Kudro, who is head of Dranith, uh, into into uh, letting Luca go, um, and then Luca escapes from the city, and with the help of Vivian, who um, is on the plane looking into some shenanigans, and so they escape from Dranith, and Vivian says, uh, "Hey, we got to go up to the Ozolith and see what's going on because it's causing all these monsters that are going crazy and attacking people mm -hmm. uh, more than they usually do. Like, mm -hmm. it's an important distinction of like monsters are always attacking people, but this is like." a lot even for Ikoria. Mm -hmm. um, and so they go up there um, and then Jirna gets sent out to follow them with a, a crew of these monster hunters. Uh, and I don't want to like get into all the details, but eventually they get to the Ozolith. Luca meets up with a bunch of Just going to spoil the entire thing today. Yeah, just all just, of it. <laughs> all of it. Luca meets up with a bunch of bonders and uh, they get to the Ozolith and there's a battle between them and the monster hunters. Um, and then Luca gets the power to control monsters. And he says, okay, well, if I take this to Dranith, then we'll have this giant monster defense force. We will weaponize the monsters, if you will. And then, uh, then everything will be great and they'll have to take me back. Um, but Kudro and the others refuse. They're, they're not going for this plan. And so Luca decides he's just gonna attack the city, take it over, because that's the only way he can get home. And Vivian and Jirina and the others have to defend it from Luca and ultimately succeed. That's the the brief summary. Cool. Um, what uh, what about um, what what about this story really resonated with you? What were your favorite parts to write? The the Bonders are a lot of fun um, because the of the way they sort of take on the monster characteristics makes them really interesting characters to write. Um, there's a bunch of people who have talked about how some of the characters in the story are like depicted on 
some of the non-named cards. And really what mm -hmm. happened was I asked uh, Nick, I'm like, you know, I need to make up a bunch of Bonder characters to be part of this story. Like, send me all the art that we've got. And so like, mm -hmm. I did that to like, to describe these characters. So I'm like, why not? You know, we've got these yeah. incredible artists drawing all this cool stuff, I gotta use it. So, so that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, although <laughs> it, it brought home quite how big the size differences are. Um, I forget what the card is, but it's the one with the, the giant white horned tiger. And I'm trying to figure out quite how large it is. And I'm like, that's like really big. Like it's like <laughs> building sized uh, compared to some of the other monsters, uh, which uh, is just what Ikoria is all about, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and one one of the one of the cool tricks, and I'm sure a lot of our community knows this, is when you look in the art, you can tell how big it is by how big the birds are. <laughs> nice. We birds are scale, the universal scale birds. In, scale in all, birds. Like, yeah. If you ever make a plane with giant birds, everyone can be very confused. Oh my god, uh, perish the thought. I really hope that never happens. Um, <laughs> birds, but, birds are like the bananas of uh, of magic art. Yeah, always right, the same. Yeah. Um, but yeah, coming up with weird monsters is kind of like my jam. I love mm -hmm. doing that. If you look at my like original books, there's all kinds of weird stuff in there. And so that was like a lot of fun when, when, uh, Nick and Paul told me like, ah, oh, this is, you know, the plane of monsters and there's going to be monsters everywhere. I was like, that's amazing. Well, that reminds me. Um, so I actually, I went, as I was reading, I, I bookmarked some stuff. And so I hope you don't mind me reading your own writing at you. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but this this was one of the one such description I, I really enjoyed. So it says uh, this is on page six, so it's not even very far in. Uh, the nightmare slid into the clearing like an inky shadow, insinuating itself out of the darkness. It was big, taller than a horse, and much longer, with eight long legs, and uh, ending in splayed talons. A snaky whip tail curved behind it, and its diamond shaped head rose on a long, sinuous neck studded with bony spikes. Three pairs of red eyes, all glowing like banked embers, topped with a long jaw, jaw full of corkscrew fangs, with a pair of worm-like tongues threaded between them. So for descriptions like that, which are, are very detailed and very evocative, how... Uh, and terrify and, and terrifying. And terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying also. Terrifying. Nightmares are awesome. I love them. <laughs> Were you, so were you working from images? Were you working from descriptions? How much of that came from your head? How much of that came from stuff you were given? I mean, a lot of it comes from, there's a, there's a sort of world guide that they put together, mm -hmm. um, which is the, it's sort of the same guide that they give to the artists when they're, you know, contracting people to draw the art for the cards. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of art, which I assume is by the sort of magic, you know, Watsy internal artists to put this together. So by the time they bring me in, which is fairly late in the process, there's a lot of art already done. So a lot of it, what I'm working from is images. Um, and it's it's amazing. Like I wish every project I worked on had this caliber of art because you know, mm -hmm. you just, like I need to visualize this and you flip through and there's just like wonderful painting after painting of this stuff. Um, but uh, in Ikoria, the, the monsters are divided up into the, I think there's five categories. God, my memory's going. Um, but they all that have a very right. distinct we have five look. Colors. And yeah. so um, that helps a lot because I'm like, okay, like the nightmares all, this is kind of what they look like. They're black mm -hmm. and they have weird legs and many eyes and, and kind of insectoid features. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can sort of construct it from there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, mostly I'm working from pictures. You know, we get this world guide full of all the like cool background world information and then all the art that's been done. Okay. Um, let's let's shift from monsters for a second and talk about some of the human characters, uh, specifically Luca, the the main character. So Luca was totally new. Um, mm -hmm. He has a, a really fleshed out and interesting arc. Um, what was your approach to writing Luca? It was really interesting because it was not when we when we first looked at it, the arc that they they wanted me to do was not what I expected. I expected something sort of more straightforward and heroic. And I mm -hmm. was sort of talking about that. And then Nick says, no, man, this is a this is a villain origin story, right? This is the Joker. Mm. Um, now, I, obviously, uh, I don't know anything about the future direction of story. So don't infer from that where Luca's gonna go from here. <laughs> but that's that's where they wanted me to end up. And so that, that was a really interesting challenge um, because it's not just a straightforward story. Like, it seems like it would be really obvious to do like the story of like, Drenith is really insensitive against bonders 
and then Luca gets to be a bonder and he teaches them to be friends and then they mm -hmm. defeat some bad guy. And that's like not the story we did, which is really kind of kind of cool. It's not mm -hmm. the sort of the thing that you would expect. Um, so that was a little difficult, but also really fun. Uh, okay, what was difficult about it? Uh, we needed to sympathize with Luca, especially in the first half of the story because he's the main character and we're largely in his point of view. So mm -hmm. if we don't sympathize with him, no one will care and the story will be boring. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we need to uh, make sure that his descent into uh, being a bad guy is like explicable. It's not like someone throws a switch and all of a sudden he's evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's a tricky balance to walk. You know, I hope I did an okay job with it, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's hard. Okay. Um, you know, because it's not like he just gets like mind controlled and all of a sudden he's just, you know, the arch villain. Yeah. So was there, were you trying to make it so it was difficult to tell when he crossed the line? Um, what was your tactic there? Yeah. Um, not so much difficult to tell when he crossed the line, but that when he does, you can understand why. Mm -hmm. um, and so that while, while Luca obviously does a lot of bad stuff and the sort of point where he goes to being an out and out villain is probably when he, he uh, kills General Kudro and decides to attack Dranit. At mm -hmm. the same time, Kudro has been kind of awful to him this whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we kind of sympathize with that. Yeah. Um, even though we're like, mm, mm, we probably shouldn't take over the city with your horrible monsters. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it, it's kind of that. It's that, you know, that you should understand what he's doing, even if you don't agree with it. Okay. Uh, now, you also wrote um, a, another ebook for us uh, set on Ravnica, which was an established world with a lot of established mm -hmm. characters. How was this different from writing that? It was. I'd say easier just because on Ravnica, there's a lot, like I had a lot to work with, but on mm -hmm. the other hand, I had to try to maintain consistency. Um, so there was just like a lot of material to go through and make sure I wasn't contradicting things. And, you know, there's some stuff even still that I screwed up. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but also, you know, just a lot of little details. Um, you know, for me, it's always easier to make stuff up than it is <laughs> to like get it from a reference material. I never have problems making things up. And so mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's fun working in Ravnica and a lot of the, you know, the advantage there is that people care about this stuff already. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't have to start from scratch sort of establishing characters. People know who Ralph Eric is and they know who Niv Mizzet is and they know who um, Polis is and so on. Um, whereas here, you know, if people were going to care about these characters, it all has to come from this story because aside from Vivian, nobody knows who they are. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about other worlds, let me drop in one of the questions from chat. Oh, I love, I love chat questions. Yeah, I'm questions excited. are great. Hello, I'm excited. Um, so, uh, Django, how familiar are, how familiar are you with the wider world of magic lore? And do you have any favorite characters that you haven't written? Uh, yeah, mm. I probably would have to say no to the second one because there's so I was completely unfamiliar with the world of magic lore mm -hmm. until um, basically until I started on this mm -hmm. um, uh, or I guess actually before we even got this contract my agent was like hey are you interested in this here's some you know magic stuff and I think we he sent me some of Doug Byer's stuff from uh, mm -hmm. from Ravnica, and I read that. But after we, you know, I knew I was doing this, I read as much as I could out of all the Volus Cycle stuff mm -hmm. um, and all the past Ravnica stuff. Um, but that was all sort of stuff that I had read leading up to what I was going to write about. So right. I have a pretty good familiarity with that, but not so much beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. No, no, good. Uh, and so I don't really have a favorite character beyond the ones I've written because you know in the interest of of time I've kind of stuck to the stuff that I was going to need mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah so it's there's so much magic lore it's really easy to uh get lost in that that is definitely true um let's <coughs> I promise I don't have coronavirus 
you're not near me um <laughs> that's true I'm at least six <laughs> miles away um so <clears throat> let's go back to um we, we kind of talked about the bonders earlier um who was your favorite supporting character to write and what did you like about them now i'm forgetting their names um God, someone's gonna have to fill me in on the name. Chat, fill I me could, in on the name. I could, of, yeah, chat. The, 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 girl, get the you. girl, the girl with the bouncy pink monster, because that was a lot of fun. Oh, that's you know what? I'm I'm in that part of the book. I can I can yeah. find it pretty. It's quick. about fifty six percent of the way. It's in. about yeah, fifty six percent of the way through. Uh, um, those are names that I just made up. So like, but that was a lot of fun because she's Br kind of is like it Bryn. Might be Bryn. <clears> the, so <throat> the Bonders were Bryn, Abda. Let's see, yeah. Barrow. Anyway, um, I remember Zeph is the one with the giant wolf, um, right. but uh, but I like the bouncy pink monster. Um, that wasn't on a card, so if you guys ever want to do that as a card, go for it. Okay. Um, I know you're not actually in charge of that. Um, I talk to people, you know. But uh, but that was a lot of fun because she's just sort of this like happy-go-lucky type. I wanted a good like. When he meets with the Bonders, I wanted there to be like a serious one and a, a kind mm -hmm. of wacky one and, and a more depressed one and blah, blah, blah. Just so we have like a good uh, cross section of the reactions of people to, you know, Luca showing up and being like, hey, guys, I have a plan. And they're like, really? I Yeah, I think it's Bryn. Okay. It's Bryn. Yeah. I forget which um, ones are the monsters and which ones are the bon are the bonders. Bryn, Bryn is the one who, after learning that Vivian is a planeswalker, says, yeah. "When we're done, can you take me to the moon?" Which <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I love how the bonders visually reflect their monsters. That's such a mm -hmm. good, like, visual marker, um, and it leads to just some really amazing, like, character designs. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Okay, where are we? I've lost my track. Okay, so you like Bryn. Um, so now that people have had a chance to read the story, um, and, and we were talking before the stream that you you normally don't read reviews, but you have been checking in on this one, and then the reviews have been, have been pretty glowing across the board. Um, but were there any reactions that um, surprised or excited you along the way? Um. I mean, obviously, I'm really happy that people. It seems to be working for people. You know, the the comments on on my Twitter and on Reddit and you know Amazon reviews have all been pretty positive, which is mm -hmm. good. Um, you know, that's my goal is to to make people happy with the story. Um, I was surprised at how much people liked finding the the sort of unnamed characters in the art on the cards. Mm -hmm. I hadn't like intended to do that because. Honestly, at the point when I'm writing the story, the cards don't have names. They have like placeholder names for the most part. Yep. Um, and so I didn't know what those cards would be called, but it made it a kind of cool Easter egg hunt that I was like, people got really excited about. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's a cool thing to have done by accident. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that was a cool surprise. All right. Um, let's see. All right. I'm going to read some more of your own stuff back at you. So one of the things I enjoyed, and let me see if I can find the page. I know it's in here, uh, was that you do a really good job of, you, you know, the, the book isn't a humor book, but you, you do a good job of throwing in these little lines every once in a while that are kind of surprise and delight and, and just kind of humorous. This was my favorite because it, it rang so true. Um, this is, yeah, we're bar barely into the book. Luca had just gone out monster hunting and was about to head home. It also happened to be home of the most beautiful woman in the world. Luca smiled wider and quickened his step. That, that sounds very generic. He loves his, you know, fiance. She's very beautiful. The next line, the most beautiful woman in the world glared at him over the top of her half moon spectacles. Um, wh where did that come from? It, it feels personal almost um maybe i don't know i my 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 wife and i joke sometimes that our relationship makes it into every relationship i i write and that she writes yeah she's also a writer so uh there may be a little bit of that but um it's important to have the little bits of levity um because like nobody is like deadly serious all the time mm -hmm. um i mean maybe somebody some people are but uh in, in magic, I mean, there are some characters who, who always seem to be serious, but uh, 
for the most part, like it helps distinguish when things have gotten really bad later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, early on, you know, you like Luca's not like he's a monster hunter, but he's not just like grim faced. Oh, I'm going to kill everyone. Like he's got, you know, a lighter side to his personality. So you got to mm -hmm. show that. Um, yeah. OK, um, I'm going to ask you one of the questions that we got most on Twitter of anything else. Um, we got it a couple different ways, but I'm just going to ask the kind of the core question. Um, is there any hint as to who was behind messing with the Ozolith? So there are definitely hints in the book. Um, if you read it carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it is basically still to be revealed. Uh, it is definitely something that we know um, uh, that that I and Nick and Paul and the story team know, and I assume they're going to use it later. Uh, mm -hmm. I, again, have no knowledge of where they're going from here, so I can't really <laughs> reveal anything. But my guess would be that uh, there will be some, some reference made in the future. OK. All right. Um, another question, we're, we're getting it in chat, and we, we definitely get it on Twitter, too. Uh, what about um, any hints about where Luca landed in the end? That one, um, again, it's there's not re it's not intended to be really definitive in the book. Mm -hmm. um, although in this case, like I had some vague ideas, but I didn't want to tie down whoever came after me too much. Okay, because it's a uh, you know obviously they hadn't really decided at that point on what was going to be the next thing for Luca, and I don't know if they have yet, but there'll be something. So um, I can't really say because I don't know if the next person will end up using what I put in there um, or if they'll just be like, oh, you know, it was, it was a swamp on some, some plane somewhere. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so uh, it's uh, probably yet to be written. Okay. So I, I think that's a good jumping off point for another one of the big questions we got is um, how much of the story were, were ideas that came from you and how many things were uh, you know, plot points or instructions that came from Wizards of the Coast? And I think just generally you can kind of talk about what that working relationship is like crafting this book. It's, it's surprisingly collaborative. Um, I think I said this last time I was on the stream, but because um, it applied to Ravnica also, but it was the same here where you know, the, before I did this the first time, I really expected to just be sort of handed an outline of a story and said, this is what you're doing, do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was much more collaborative than that. So I come in um, uh, and meet up with, uh, with Nick and he sort of shows me, excuse me, what they've got, you know, what the, what the art looks like. And, um, you know, they've got a list of the cards that are sort of key to the main story and, and where the art is for those mm -hmm. um, and what they've got for the story. And then sort of where it plugs into other things um, and the sort of basic outline of where they want it to go. And then we talk over how that's gonna feel and what it's gonna, you know, what it's gonna be like. And um, so like the larger plot points are there. Like for this one, I'd say we had, we knew we had Luca, we knew we had Vivienne, we knew we had mm -hmm. Jirana and Kudro. <clears throat> Those all appear on their own cards. And so obviously they all, you know, existed. Mm -hmm. We knew they were going to go to the Ozolith and that that was going to be involved in controlling the monsters. And we knew the sort of basic outlines of where Luca's arc was going to end up. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, um, it was all just kind of very unformed. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I think Jirna ended up being a much larger part of the story once I was done with it um, because I felt like we needed another. Uh, sort of positive heroic point of view to like actually feel like we came to a, you know, an actual successful conclusion at the end of the story. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I basically, I just talked to them, uh, you know, Nick and Paul are the ones who were working with me this time um, on about, you know, my ideas and then they have suggestions and we go back and forth and then I'm a I'm an outline guy. So I write a long outline of what I think this is going to look like and I send it to them and they, tweak and change stuff and then I go from there. Um, the really interesting thing is there's there's some things that are absolutely set in stone mm -hmm. 
<coughs> because either they have to interface with a future set or a past set, I guess, or mm -hmm. the art is already done. Because yeah. once the art is done, you can't change that. The mm -hmm. timeline for the art is much longer than the timeline for the story. So mm -hmm. by the time I come in, some artist has already been drawing things for like three months. Right. Okay. Um, so you said um, the one character was, uh, her larger part in the story uh, was something that came from you. Do you have another example of anything that came from, from your mind and, and Paul and Nick? Oh. Were like, yeah, let's do that. All the bonders, for sure. Um, we, you know, the, our story was just like, the original beat was like, you know, Luca meets up with some bonders. And so like, we needed some bonders. And so all those are just things that I invented. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the way this like copper coat military functions um, mm -hmm. and how they have elite squads and what the monster hunters look like and blah, blah, blah. Or not what they look like, because we have pictures of them, but what their like behavior is like. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was good and that's that's like I don't want to say it's my wheelhouse I'm not like an expert but I've written military stuff before and so I have you know research that I've done in that area that kind of applies gotcha um, all right so yeah some little world building things um so there have been a, a number of questions too both in chat and, and on twitter um would you uh ever be interested in writing either a question came in different forms uh more about Ikoria, more about Luca, anything? Would you ever be interested in expanding on these these characters in this place that you've already written about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd obviously, I'd love to do more more stuff for, for Magic in general. Um, mm -hmm. Either of those could be interesting. Uh, for Luca, it, I imagine it's gonna be part of a larger story at some point, you know, uh, he's gonna, gonna go run into someone else and it's always fun sort of crossing over characters. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in Ikoria, there's some like bonders I'd love to see. Like I'd love to see one of the, like do a sympathetic protagonist who's like bonded with a nightmare and is like kind of a weirdo. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a lot of cool stories you could tell. If you look through the setting, like there's a whole lava city that we didn't get to in, mm -hmm. in Sundered Bond. Cause you know, you can only cram so much stuff into one story. So I don't, I definitely try not to, you know, push every single thing in the set into the story because then it just feels like a weird sort of set of cameos. Mm -hmm. So there's stuff. I mean, we could we could look in on Narset and see what she was actually doing there. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Wanderers on one of the cards that we didn't touch on at all. So there's there's stuff in there that we could go back to for Ikoria for sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, you brought up Narset. Yeah. And and that's that's been the most common question actually in chat so far is what's Narset doing on Ikoria? And I, I don't I mean again I'm only fifty six percent of the way through the book, but I haven't <laughs> seen Narset in your book yet, so I don't know if she shows up later. There's a couple of brief cameos. Basically, Vivian knows that she's on Ikoria, but can't find her. Okay. Uh, to help with with the battle, mm -hmm. um, and that's I mean from my point of view as a writer it's because we already basically have enough characters and I didn't there's not space in a 50,000 word novella to mm -hmm. really develop another complete character and I didn't want to give Narset short shrift and just be like oh and then she was there too yeah um but um so there's just a couple little mentions because we knew she was going to be in the set mm -hmm. um so, you know, yeah, that's the kind of thing you'd want to explore in another story. And so if you ask me what she's doing there, I have no idea. But, you know, if you, someone wants to write about it or if they want me to write about it, I wouldn't mind. All right. Um, let's see. We, we asked that. We asked that. Um, then we had uh, someone on Twitter who actually just asked a bunch of non match related questions, but I thought they were good questions because they're about oh. you. Um, so what's something in your early career that hindered you, but later turned out to be a blessing? My early writing career? Sure. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, so the, the classic example. So after I sold my first book to, uh, which is the, called The Thousand Names, and it's a Napoleonic military fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, and I sold it to Penguin. Um, and my editor was like, we need an outline for the rest of this series. And at the time I was very against outline. Um, <laughs> I was like, I just want to do what I want to do. It hindered my creativity, blah, blah, blah. It's so hard. Didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And my agent was like, you have to do it. 
you know, they're not going to buy this otherwise. And so, ah, fine. so I took like a month and I wrote an outline for the rest of the series. And it was so hard. It was like mm-hmm. the hardest work I've ever done in my life. That's not literally <laughs> true, but it felt like it at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was miserable. And finally I turned it and I was like, ah, oh, that was miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the time came to write the second book and I had this outline to work from. And I couldn't help but notice it was like way easier. <laughs> and it went so much more smoothly than the first book had, which had taken, first book took me like three years and the second book took me like six months. And oh, I was wow. Like, oh, wow, this is way easier. And like at that point, I became kind of a convert and like outlines are still hard, but they're so useful to me now. I can't imagine not working that way. Um, okay. And so it just like changed my process forever. Um, so. That mm-hmm. there, there's an example. And mm-hmm. I should, um, I always hasten to add, like, that's me. Like, every writer is different. So don't take that as like admonition from Django that yeah. everyone should do outlines. That's just mm-hmm. like my <laughs> personal process. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So they had a, another question. What's a funny story about you that your family likes to tell? Oh my God. I want to uh, ask that same question to Blake, actually. <laughs> funny story about me that my does it have to be my family no it doesn't have um, to be family it can be friends my friends like to tell the story that i when i accidentally drove past pennsylvania um because <laughs> we were supposed to be driving we were driving from new york to pittsburgh which we did a lot because i grew up in new york mm-hmm. um and went to college in pittsburgh um and i was just kind of like driving along the highway and not really paying attention and when like my friend Dave, who was in the car with me, was like, why does that sign say, welcome to Ohio? Um, and we had <laughs> driven past the end of Pennsylvania and into Ohio. Oh, no. It's just how absent-minded professory I can sometimes get. Although in my defense, it's actually not that hard to do. It's really only about three exits on the Pennsylvania Turnpike that you okay. have to miss to get from Pittsburgh to Ohio. It sounds funny, though. Like you yeah. missed a whole state. I missed basically. a whole state. Missed a whole state. Uh, and last question from this individual: uh, What's something you believed for a long time that you later changed your mind about? Ooh. Yeah, that one was deep. Like you, deep. you were, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think how obscure to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so there's a book called, it sounds like the most boring book ever. It's called Measuring and Managing Performance in Organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's about running a software company. Um, and I was a software guy for many years before I was a writer. Okay. Um, and it's about um, creating metrics for software companies and, and how you can, you know, create these metrics and measure how your team hits them. And this is a popular way that people try to manage software companies. And the thesis of this book, which is argued extremely effectively is this is a disaster. Don't do it. Metrics are terrible. Um, And it convinced me. And I've been trying to sell that to every company I've worked for ever since, usually with not particularly good results since managers love metrics. Mm -hmm. But um, (laughs) Fair enough. That's that's kind of an obscure answer, but it's one of the times I can think of where I read a book and I'm like, holy cow, this guy is absolutely right. So go read the book. It's interesting. Uh, not not what fair. I would have expected. As not what I would have expected. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very different. Know, man. That's, why we, that's, why the, that's why these questions were that's great. Why you got off the top of my head here. Thank you, <laughs> random Twitter human. Um, okay, we have got a number. We're going to go back to magic. We're going we're okay. to move from personal Django philosophy questions to um, uh, so Lava Brink is not uh, really doesn't play a huge role besides getting mentioned a few times in your yeah. um, but obviously but you were familiar with it it was part of the world guide and there's all kinds of art so it looked really cool I just couldn't think of a really good reason to go there and it okay. according to the world design is kind of a long way away so it seemed okay. like a real stretch to go there especially when we're going to have anyone who can like teleport or fly yeah so if you if you had gone there what what are some things you might have done in lava brink i don't know i mean it depends who goes there but Mm -hmm. you could have some cool lava monsters that would be a lot of fun Mm -hmm. like you could have like swimming lava fish or like those skeleton fish from mario um or like a (laughs) 
giant lava turtle or you know worms and stuff mm -hmm. there could be like caves underneath that are filling up with lava that'd be fun you have some cool action scenes um all right cool uh if you could be a planeswalker what planeswalker would you be like which specific character yes mm. i don't know um i mean obviously i have a lot of sympathy for ral zarek um, both because I wrote that book and then also he's kind of like a tech nerd, which is kind of what I am. Mm -hmm. um, so Ral Zarek or Sahili Rai, is she a planeswalker or is she just a character? Yeah, Sahili's a, a planeswalker. planeswalker. Okay. Yep. Um, cause they're both the like tinkerer inventor types and that's definitely like me. Okay. Very cool. Um, so let's, let's shift again to non-magic stuff. What are you working on now? What do you have coming up for, for people who enjoyed your stories? What should they look for next? I have two main things going on right now. I mean, I have three series that I've written. One of them is done. Um, so there's the Shadow Campaigns is a military fantasy series um, set in a kind of muskets and cannon and magic world. Mm -hmm. um, very loosely paralleling the Napoleonic Wars. The first book is called The Thousand Names. That's five books and that's out and done. Uh, for people who enjoyed the magic stuff, the thing I often recommend is um, my YA series, which is called uh, The Wells of Sorcery. The, the first book is Ship of Smoke and Steel. Um, and it has the magic system, I don't want to say it's similar to Magic the Gathering, but it has the same feel as the modern magic lore where people kind of have intrinsic powers. Mm -hmm. um, so our main character has like sort of Psylocke style magic blades. Um, and uh, she's a kind of vicious street criminal who gets dumped onto a kind of magical ghost ship where they have a kind of Lord of the Flies society and she has to learn to take over the ghost ship while also learning that she should care about other human beings. Um, and so that's a lot of fun. The two books of that are out and I just turned in the third one, which will be out in January and that'll be the end of that series. So that's, that's uh, one thing I'm currently working on. And then the other one is um, a new epic fantasy series called Ashes of the Sun, which is, um, it's uh, it's hard to describe. It's about two siblings, um, one of whom is discovered to be, you know, a magic user in the in the style of that world, which means she has mm -hmm. this sort of intrinsic, awesome magical power, and she gets sort of taken away by the the order which manages such things. Uh, and her brother is really mad about this, um, and so she grows up sort of believing in the order and how they defend civilization. And then he goes and becomes a rebel and delves into dungeons looking for dark magic. And then once they're both grown up, it, they come back together and that's, the, that's where the story goes. So it's a lot of fun. It was like vaguely inspired by some conversations with friends of mine about the Star Wars prequels and how the Jedi are actually sort of creepy because they like take these kids at age five and are like, you're going to be an ascetic warrior monk, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of wanted to to do a story with that aesthetic and and sort of interrogate how weird it is and what it might produce. So it's a lot of fun. I love Star Wars, so that's uh, that's a thing. I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's like a weird thing. Yeah, is it, is so it kind of like niche. Niche. It's is pretty it kind of like Star Trek? I don't... Yeah, yeah okay. a war in the stars, crazy, <laughs> crazy. Anyway, Ashes of the Sun comes out. Uh, July 21st, I think it is. Um, okay. And that's the first book in that series. Um, and I'm really excited to finally share it with everyone. I finished it like last year and it feels like it's been a century since then. 2020 has been a heck of a decade. I it's just, know. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think that is all the questions we have for today. So Django, Thank you so much for coming on. Um, if people want to coming back, you, yeah, yeah coming back. Uh, if I've people want to ask so you so much more, else to do, you know. <laughs> uh, if people want to ask you more questions about Sundered Bond, which is available to purchase as an ebook, you can find it on Amazon right now. Uh, if people want to ask you more questions about Sundered Bond, uh, how how would they get in contact with you? Um, Probably the best way is either at Django Wexler on Twitter, um, which is my sort of main social media outlet, or if you go to my website, which is DjangoWexler.com, uh, then you can 
um, there's a contact form and you can write me an email um, and I'm always happy to answer there. There's also info about all my books um, if any of the stuff I've said has uh, piqued your interest. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you, Django, so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I do want to give one quick correction. I gave it in chat, but I want to make sure I say it out loud. Uh, the arena code we gave at the beginning of the show should be FNM at home. Not play at home. F Not play at home. FNM at home. Uh, we had it wrong at the beginning of the show, but FNM at home should work. So give that a try. Uh, otherwise, we'll be back next week. Uh, maybe with Django again. Who knows? Who, yeah, even, who even knows? Why not? We'll just anything can happen. happen. <laughs> I'm just going to start hosting this show with you guys, even though I don't know anything about magic. Uh, you know, I would love that. Game. Can we it's do that? It's Wexler MTG <laughs> on Thursdays. You guys can. We'll just have to explain everything to me every five seconds. Like, what's that mechanic? How does that work again? Yeah. How, what is that? <laughs> Uh, well, Blake right. and I will be back next week doing something. We're, yeah, we're not something. sure yet. Something. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We will. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks.